Praise the Lord, everybody, praise the Lord. This is Brother Parrott. Brother Harlan Parrott today, coming to you in the name of the Lord. And we hope that uh, you will get something out of this tape. It is Wednesday, the 11th day of October, the year 2000. And we are continuing our study here on tape 15 with the uh, uh, divided chaotic kingdom stage, which began with Solomon's son, Jeroboam, I'm sorry, Rehoboam, and uh, well, it began with that too, uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, uh, had... Uh, said that he was going to make the yoke that his father Solomon put up on the people a whole lot heavier. So Rehoboam remained down in Jerusalem and Jeroboam went up north, the capital of Samaria, and built the two calves, one in Bethel, one in Dan, and took ten tribes with him. So there was a divided kingdom, a civil war had broken out, and we're continuing our study here with uh, these wonderful, wonderful records. We left off, we got into it a little bit, but we're going to uh, rehearse it again. The prophet Obadiah, and uh, he well, lived around, prophesied around 848 B.C. Introduction. Obadiah is the shortest and smallest Old Testament book. We know nothing about the author except his name, which means the servant of the Lord. Obadiah has only one theme, and that concerns the destruction of the nation, Edom, for her, its treachery toward Judah. There were at least four instances when Edom helped in the plunder of Jerusalem and Judah. These were a during the reign of Joram, 853 B.C., 2 Chronicles 21, verse 8, 16, and 17, and Amos chapter 1, verse 6. B, during the reign of Amaziah in 796 B.C., 2 Chronicles 25, verse 11, 12, 23, and 24. And C, during the reign of Ahaz, 735 B.C. Uh, 2 Chronicles 28, verse 16 through 21. And during the reign of Zedekiah, 597 B.C. 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 11 through 21. And Psalm chapter 137, verse 7. The house of Edom, to be reviled by God, chapter 1, verse 1 through 16. They had become proud and arrogant because they lived in those high, inaccessible mountain cliffs which surrounded their capital, the city of Petra. Note, these unique ruins, cut out of the solid cliffs of rose-colored rock and long hidden in the arid regions of the Dead Sea, were discovered in A.D. 1812. Esau had founded and fathered this proud people. See Genesis 25, verse 30, and Genesis 36, verse 1. God prophesied every nook and cranny of Petra would be searched and robbed and every treasure found and taken. Edom's allies would turn against them. Their wise men would be filled with stupidity. Edom was noted for her wise men. Eliphaz, the wisest of Job's three friends, was from Teman, five miles east of Petra in Edom. See Job 2, verse 11, Obadiah 1, verse 8. The mightiest soldiers of Teman would be confused and helpless to prevent this awful slaughter. Because of their treacherous land, number B, chapter 1, verse 10 through 16, they deserted their blood brothers, Judah, in time of great need. Both peoples were, of course, related, for the twin brothers, Jacob and Esau, were their forefathers. They stood aloof, refusing to lift even one finger to help. They actually rejoiced over Judah's agony. They mocked them. They occupied their lands after the captivity. They stood at the crossroads and killed those trying to escape. They did not murder with they did they those who did not murder were returned to Judah's enemies and became or became prisoners of war. The house of Jacob to be reviled by God, chapter one, verse seventeen through twenty one. In spite of their terrible per persecutions and punishments, some deserved and others undeserved, Judah will someday be fully restored to Palestine. The Israelites will then control tremendous land area, even 
never the ones never before occupied, including the land of Edom. Judah will rule over Edom and Peter from Jerusalem during the millennial reign. Note, some of these prophecies concerning Edom have already come to pass, at least in part. By 312 B.C., the Nabataeans, an Arab people, had displaced the Edomites living in Petra. They then fled to southern Palestine and were later subdued by the Jewish military hero John Hyrcanus, H-Y-R, Hyrcanus, during the Maccabean period, 134 through 104 B.C. The wicked king Herod came from this displaced group of Edomites. They were destroyed in A.D. 70 along with the Jews when they revolted against the Roman Empire. Other scripture verses which foretell the doom of Edom are Isaiah 34, verse 5 through 15, Ezekiel 25, verse 12 through 14, 35, verse 1 through 15, and Amos chapter 1, verse 1, 11, and 12. In spite of the nation's sins, a gracious God will someday restore Edom. See Isaiah 11, verse 14. The writing prophets of the chaotic kingdom stage include this Obadiah, and he prophesied 850 to 840 uh, in the dates of destination of his ministry. Jonah uh, the years of his ministry. Now, years of Obadiah was 10. His ministry was 10 years. Jonah's ministry was 35 years long, from 785 to 750 in he preached in Nineveh. Nahum's ministry was 30 years, 650 to 620 B.C. He preached in Nineveh. Amos was 7 years, 760 to 753. He preached in northern Israel. Joel seven years, 841 to 834 B.C., he preached to the south, which was Judah. Isaiah was 58 years, 739 to 681, he preached to the south. Micah was 35 years, 735 to 700, he preached to the south, <coughs> Judah. Zephaniah was 20 years, 640 to 620, he preached to Judah in the south also. Habakkuk, uh, three years, 609 to 606, he preached to the south. Jeremiah, 32 years, 627 to 575, he preached to the south. And Lamentations, which was Jeremiah's book, preached to the south also, 586 B.C. Okay, now we're going to get into the book of Joel, which was seven, uh, 835 through 796 B.C. In the introduction, as with Obadiah, Almost nothing is known concerning the prophet Joel. He was the son of Pethuel, and his name means Jehovah is God. Sometime during Joel's ministry, the land of Judah was struck by a ferocious locust plague, more intense than any experienced before. Joel, under divine inspiration, compares that terrible locust plague to the coming tribulation period. Joel is also known as the prophet of Pentecost because the words about the Holy Ghost were later quoted by Simon Peter on the day of Pentecost. Number one. Israel and God's judgment, a review of the past, Joel 1, verse 1 through 20. A, the severity of the locust judgment. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. First, chapter 1, verse 4. Some expositors interpret these words as describing the four stages in the development of the caterpillar, while others consider them to be four different kinds of insects. Locusts were often sent as the judgment from God. See Deuteronomy 28, verse 38 through 42, Exodus 10, verse 12 through 15, 1 Kings 8, verse 37, and Revelation 9, verse 1 through 12. The title name for the locust judgment, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Joel 1.15 This is the second mention of the minor prophets of the term the day of the Lord. It can be found in many passages, both in the Old and in the New Testaments. Isaiah 2 verse 12, and 13 verse 6 and verse 9, Ezekiel 13 verse 5 and 30 verse 3, Joel 2 verse 1 and verse 11 and verse 31 and Joel 3 14 Amos 5 18 and 20 Obadiah 1 15 Zephaniah 1 verse 7 and 14 
Zechariah 14 verse 1, Malachi 4 verse 5, Acts 2 20, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2, and 2 Peter 3 verse 10. The phrase is almost always a reference to the seven year tribulation period, but here in Joel 1 15 the prophet uses it to refer to the judgment then going on. Israel and God's judgment. A preview of the future. Joel 2 verse 1 through 3 verse 21. The identity of this invasion. What nation or enemy is Joel speaking of here in chapter 2 and 3? He may be referring to several in general, giving special emphasis to the last in particular. The, Syrian eva- the Assyrian invasion in 701 B.C., led by Sennacherib and crushed at the very gates of Jerusalem by God's death angel, see 2 Kings chapter 19 and Joel 2 verse 20. The Babylonian invasion, 586 B.C., led by Nebuchadnezzar, 2 Kings 24. The Russian invasion, the Middle East, in the middle during the middle of the tribulation, to be led by Gog, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And this right here is not talking about a Russian invasion. This is talking about the actual battle of Armageddon. The final invasion at the end of the tribulation to be led by the Antichrist is the battle of Armageddon, which is the same as Ezekiel 38 and 39. See Revelation 16, verse 13 through 16, and 19, verse 11 through 21. The gathering place of this invasion. I will gather... I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will judge them there. 3 verse 2. See also 3 verse 9 through 14. Note, this battle, the biggest, boldest, bloodiest, and most brazen of all time, will stretch from the city of Megiddo on the north, Zechariah 12 verse 11 and Revelation 16 verse 6, to Edom on the south, Isaiah 34 verse 5 and verse 6, and Isaiah 63 verse 1, a distance of some 200 miles. It will reach from the Mediterranean Sea on the west to the hills of Moab on the east, a distance of 100 miles. Thus, the total fighting area will exceed 20,000 square miles. The center of the action will apparently be the Valley of Jehoshaphat, located just east of Jerusalem between the Holy City and the Mount of Olives. It is also known as the Kidron Valley. The twofold purpose for this invasion invasion gathering. The purpose of the Antichrist to destroy Israel and her God. See Psalms chapter 2. The purpose of God to destroy Antichrist and its allies. The outcome of this invasion. The sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and earth shall shake. And the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel, Joel 3, 15 and 16, Revelation 19, verse 11 through 21. The blessing after this invasion has been crushed. God's Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh, Joel 2, verse 28 through 32. It should be noted that this passage event will mark the fulfillment of Moses' desire in Numbers 11, verse 29, where he said he would that God's Spirit was upon all people, and they were all prophets. Peter would later quote this passage in Joel on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 16 through 21. This he did, not to indicate that Pentecost was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, for it was not, but rather as an example of it. All human needs will be provided for, Joel 2, verse 21 through 27. Nature itself will be transformed, Joel 3, verse 18. Christ himself will reign in Zion, 321. Mount Zion is the height which rises close to the southwest corner of the old walled city. It was once within the walls of ancient Jerusalem. It is held to be one of the most sacred places in Israel because there is located the traditional tomb of David. Above it is an upper room believed to be on the site of that which upper room in which the Lord Jesus and his disciples ate the last Passover together and where he established the communion service. Mark 14 verse 12 through 16 and Luke 22 verse 7 through 13. This upper room has also been considered to be the place where the twelve disciples were gathered when the Holy Ghost came upon them on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 1 verse 12 through 14 and Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. Jonah Introduction 
He prophesied between 780 and 750 B.C. The book of Jonah is one of three Old Testament books especially hated by Satan. These are Genesis, which predicts the incarnation of Christ as the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15, where God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel, speaking to the serpent. Daniel, which predicts the glorious second coming of Christ in Daniel 7, verse 9 through 14, to destroy his enemies. Jonah, which predicts in type form the death and resurrection of Christ, Jonah 2 with Matthew 12, verse 38 through 41. There are three basic interpretations of the book of Jonah. The mythological approach, this is the liberal view which would cause which would look upon Jonah as if it were the Robinson Crusoe Gulliver or Gull of Gull Gulliver's Travels or Hercules. The allegorical or parabolic approach. In this view, the book is merely an extended parable. Thus, Jonah is really Israel. The sea is the Gentile nations in general. The fish is the Babylonian captivity. And the regurgitation in the re is the return during Ezra's time. Surely this is not the record of actual historical events, nor was it ever intended as such. It is a sin against the author to treat as literal prose what he intended as poetry. His story is thus a story with a moral and a parable, a prose poem just like the story of the Good Samaritan. Okay, the, int the literal historical approach, this alone is the correct view. The account presents itself as Actual history. The Jews and early church believed it to be literal. The author of 2 Kings 14 verse 25 refers to Jonah as a literal person. His hometown is given along with the name of his father and the king he served under. Jesus testified to the literal account of Jonah in Matthew 12 verse 38 through 41 and 16 verse 4 in Luke 11 verse 29 through 32. Jonah was from gath Hever of Zebulun, Joshua 19, verse 13, north of Nazareth in Galilee. Thus the Pharisees were in error concerning their statement recorded in John 7, 52, Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Jonah protesting, demonstrating God's patience. Chapter 1. The command of God. Go. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. God orders his prophet to proceed to Nineveh, and preach out against the city's exceeding wickedness. The act of the minister, the action of the minister, no. Jonah 1 verse 3. The futility of this action. Jonah foolishly attempts the impossible to flee from God's presence. See Psalm 139 verse 7 through 12. He purchases a fare to Tarshish, ancient name for Spain, from the port of Joppa. This port is significant for some eight centuries later, another Jewish preacher will receive a similar command to share the gospel with some Gentiles. See Acts chapter 10 verse 5. The reason for his action, why did he disobey? Several reasons have been offered because he was a coward. This is, a def this, this is definitely an error as seen by 1 verse 12 because he was an extreme nationalist. This seems to be the logical answer. At this time in history, Assyria was on the rise, and many felt it would only be a matter of time before her blood-covered boots came marching toward Palestine. The cruelty of the Assyrian armies was unparalleled in ancient history. Consider the following testimonies from various authors. Some of the victims were held down while one of the band of torturers who are portrayed upon the monuments gloating fiendishly over their fearful work, inserts his hand into the victim's mouth, grips his tongue, and wrenches it out by the root. In ancient spot, pegs are driven into the ground. To these other another victim's wrist are fixed with cords. His ankles are similarly made fast, and the man is stretched out, unable to move a muscle. The executioner then applies himself to his task. And beginning at the accustomed spot, the sharp knife makes its incision. The skin is raised inch by inch till the man is flayed alive. These skins are then stretched out upon the city walls or otherwise disposed of so as to terrify the people and leave behind long enduring impressions of Assyrian vengeance. For others, long sharp poles are prepared. They, the sufferer taken 
like all the rest from the leading men of the city is laid down the sharpened end of the pole is driven in through the lower part of the chest the pole is then raised bearing the writhing victim aloft it is planted in the hole dug for it and the man is left to die pyramids of human heads mark the path of the conqueror boys and girls were burnt alive or preserved for a worse fate men were impaled flayed alive blinded or deprived of their hands and feet or their ears and noses while the women and children were carried into slavery the captured city plundered and reduced to ashes and the trees in in its neighborhood cut down the hand of God blow 1 verse 4 through 12 of Jonah God suddenly flings a terrific wind over the sea causing a great storm the frightened sailors pray to their various pagan gods and gods and frantically frantically throw the cargo they are carrying overboard to listen to lighten the ship during this time Jonah is sound asleep in the ship's hold upon hearing this he the captain awakes him and orders that he too pray to his God for salvation. In desperation, the sailors cast lots to determine who among them had brought the storm by offending his God. The lots fall upon Jonah. Jonah admits to them his nationality and sin of disobeying God. He then advises them to throw him overboard. The action of the mariners throw, 1 verse 13 through 17. After further useless struggling, the sailor cry out for out a prayer for forgiveness for what they have to do with Jonah and quickly throw him overboard into the boiling sea. Immediately the raging waters become calm as the storm ceases. The amazed sailors give thanks to Jehovah God. Jonah is swallowed by a huge fish which God had prepared for him. Of all the miracles in the Bible, none is better known or raised more eyebrows than this. Dr. J. Vernon McGee writes, The fish here is not the hero of the story, neither is it the villain. The book is not even about a fish. The fish is among the props and does not occupy the star's dressing room. Let us distinguish between the essentials and the incidentals. Incidentals are the fish, the gore, the east wind, the boat, and Nineveh. The essentials are Jehovah and Jonah, God and man. The question is often asked as to whether a whale could actually swallow a man. In the first place, it should be pointed out that nowhere in the original Old Testament or the New Testament language does it say a whale swallowed Jonah. The word whale does not even appear in the King James Version in the book of Jonah. The Hebrew word for fish is dag and refers to a great sea monster. monster. In Matthew 12, 40, the word translated whale by the King James Version is the Greek word K-E-T-O-S, which again refers to a sea monster. In the second place, God could have used a whale had a, he chosen to. Two, Dr. Gleason Archer writes the following paragraph. Numerous cases have been recorded, reported in more recent times of men who have survived the ordeal of being swallowed by a whale. The Princeton Theological Review, October 1927, tells of two incidents, one in, in 1758 and the other in 1771, in which a man was swallowed by a whale and vomited up shortly thereafter with only minor injuries. One of the most striking instances comes from Francis Fox, 63 years of engineering page 298 through 300 who reports that this incident was carefully investigated by two scientists one of whom was M. P. de Parville the scientific editor of the journal de Bats in Paris in February 1891 the whaling ship Star of the East was in the vicinity of the Falcon Islands in the lookout sighted a large sperm whale three miles away. Two boats were lowered, and in a short time, one of the harpooners was unable to spear the creature. The second boat also attacked the whale, but was then upset by a lash of its tail so that its crew fell into the sea. One of them was drowned, but the other, James Bartley, simply disappeared without a trace. After the whale was killed, the crew set to work with axes and spades removing the blubber. They worked all day and part of the night. The next day, they attacked some, attached some tackle to the stomach, which was hoisted on deck. The sailors were startled by something in it which gave spasmodic signs of life, and inside was found the missing sailor doubled up and unconscious. He was laid on the deck and treated 
to a bath of seawater, which soon revived him. At the end of the third week, he had entirely recovered from the shock and resumed his duties. His face and neck and hands were bleached to a deadly whiteness and took on the appearance of parchment. Bartley affirms that he would probably have lived inside his house of flesh until he starved, for he had lost his senses through fright and not through lack of air. A survey of the Old Testament, page 301. Jonah praying, demonstrating God's pardon, chapter 2. The petition, Jonah 2, verse 1 through 8. Jonah immediately begins an earnest and all-out one-man prayer meeting. His altar was perhaps the strangest ever used, the slippery slopes of a fish's stomach. Some believe Jonah's language seems to indicate he actually died and was later resurrected by God. Note his phrases, out of the belly of hell or shield, I cried. Verse 2, Thou brought my, up my life from corruption. Verse 6, My soul fainted within me. Verse 7, While there is no question that God could have done this, the simple context approach would suggest Jonah did not die, but was at the point of death. On two occasions, Jonah refers to that holy temple. See verse 4 and verse 7. In fact, he points his prayer to in this direction, Jonah was no doubt calling to remembrance Solomon's temple dedication some 150 years back, 1 Kings 8, verse 38 and 39. What prayer and supplication soever be made by any man, or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his hands toward this house, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. One can almost picture the pathetic and praying prophet as he sloshed and slid around in the seaweeds wrapped around his head. The backslider is often forced to wear a strange halo. Jonah mentions a scientific fact totally unknown by human resources in that day when he speaks of the mountain which rises from off the ocean floor. See verse 6. This is just another little proof that the Bible is indeed the very word of God. Jonah renounces his sin, remembers his vow, his service, and re-consecrates his life to God. Verse 8 and 9. The pardon. His he ends his prayer with a five-word summary of the entire Bible and indeed the very plan and purpose of God. Salvation is of the Lord. Verse 9. He is then vomited up on dry land by the fish. Jonah's preaching, the demonstrating God's power, the warning, verse chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. His mission field. Nineveh lay on the eastern side of the Tigris and was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of the cities of antiquity. It had one... 1,200 towers, each 200 feet high, and its wall was 100 feet high, and of such breadth that was that three chariots could drive on its on it abreast. It was 60 miles in circumference and could, within its walls, grow enough corn, enough for the population of 600,000. Xenophon says the basement of its wall was of polished stone, and its width 50 feet. In the city was a magnificent palace with courts and walls covering more than 100 acres. The roofs were supported by beams of cedar resting on columns of cypress inlaid and strengthened by bands of sculptured silver and iron. Its gates were guarded by huge lions and bulls sculptured in stone. Its doors were of ebony and cypress and crusted with iron, silver, and ivory, and paneling. The rooms were sculptured slabs of alabaster and cylinders and bricks with cuneiform inscriptions. Hanging gardens were filled with rich plants and rare animals and served with other temples and palaces, libraries, and arsenals to adorn and enrich the city, and all was built by the labor of foreign slaves. His message, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 4. Forty is often the number of testing in the Bible as indicated by the following. The flood rains continue forty days and forty nights in Noah's time. Genesis 7 verse 17. Moses spent forty days on Mount Sinai. Exodus 24 verse 18. The twelve spies searched out Palestine for forty days. Numbers 13 verse 25. 
Israel wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, in Numbers 14:33. Jesus was tempted for 40 days, Matthew 4, verse 2. Forty days elapsed between his resurrection and his ascension, Acts 1, verse 3. The anointing, the, uh, the morning, Jonah 3, verse 5 through 9. This chapter describes the greatest revival in all recorded history. No other physical miracle in this book or in any other Old Testament book compares with the marvel and extent of this spiritual miracle. In the New Testament, Jesus later warned that his entire generation in general would someday be drastically affected because the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold a greater than Jonah is here. Matthew 12 verse 41. The critic, however, always anxious to knock the Bible, has gleefully pointed out that secular history records no such revival in Nineveh as recorded here. Dr. H. Freeman writes, the complaint that there is no record of Nineveh's repentance in secular history is not only a valueless argument from silence, but ignores the fact that the event is recorded in biblical history in the book of Jonah. Remember the Hittites. They were an ancient people mentioned in more than a dozen Old Testament books. Of the Hittites, no trace could be found, leading some critics to view the Old Testament references with suspicion. Archaeological discoveries in the early part of the 20th century, however, not only confirmed the biblical references to be accurate, but also revealed the Hittites to be an important people with an extended empire during the 14th and 13th centuries B.C. Introduction to the Old Testament. However, secular history may indeed hint to this sacred revival recorded in Jonah after all. It is known that about this time there was a religious movement in Nineveh which resulted in a change from the worship of many gods to that one uh, god whom they called Nebo. Nebo was the son of the Babylonian trinity. His name meant the proclaimer, the prophet. He was the proclaimer in the mind of and will of the Trinity head. Nebo was the god of wisdom, the creator, the angelic overseer. Some believe Nebo has had been worshipped in earlier days as the only supreme god. It is known that the Nineveh ruler Adal Ninarari the third, eight ten through seven eighty three BC had advocated a monotheistic worship system of some kind. If the revival took place at this time as a result of Jonah's preaching, then the use of the national name for the Son of God is what we might possibly expect. Jonah did not preach repentance to the Ninevites in the name of Yahweh, the Hebrew God of the covenant, but in the name of Elohim, the creator of the universe, Genesis 1 verse 1. Some believe, however, that the revival took place a little later under the reign of King Esserdan III, 771 through 754 B.C. If so, then God had even more time to prepare the Ninevites for a great plague had occurred in 765 B.C. A total eclipse of the sun took place on June 15, 763 B.C., and another plague fell in 759 B.C. The Transforming, 3 verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from the evil way. God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Two phrases in this verse deserve a brief comment. God repented, that is, God changed his previously intended course of action. See also Genesis 6, verse 6, Exodus 32, verse 14, and 2 Samuel 24, verse 16 of the evil. While it is true the Hebrew word ra, here translated evil, is usually connected with sin, it can also be and is often translated by such words as affliction, calamity, distress, grief, harm, trouble, and sorrow. The context would show that the latter meaning is meant here in Jonah 3.10. See also Jonah 1 verse 7 and 8 in Isaiah 45 verse 7 for similar examples. Jonah pouting, demonstrating God's pity. Chapter 4, Lamenting Over a City, Jonah 4, verse 1 through 5. This chapter, along with 2 Samuel chapter 11, 1 Kings 19, Genesis 9, and also chapter 13, and others demonstrate beyond any reasonable doubt that the Bible is not a book that man would write if he could. Here God's chosen minister is presented as a petty and pouting prophet sitting on a hill outside Nineveh and hoping the city will refuse his previous message and be destroyed. Surely Jeremiah's sober words apply here in Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it?
He reluctantly acknowledges the grace, mercy, and goodness of God, and then in brazen desperation and disappointment dares to pray. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah 4, verse 3. See Numbers 11, verse 15 for Moses, Jeremiah 20, verse 14 through 18 for Jeremiah, 1 Kings 19, verse 4 for Elijah, and similar requests. God then attempts to reason with Jonah as he once did with Cain, Genesis 4, verse 6 and 7, and as he still does with sinners everywhere, Isaiah 1, verse 18. Learning under a gourd, 4, verse 5 through 11. Jonah makes a leafy lean to shelter and continues to sit sulking on the hillside. When the sun has withered the leafy shelter to Jonah's surprise and grief, God arranges for a vine to grow quickly and shade him. But God also prepares a worm which soon eats through the vine stem and kills it. Finally, the Lord subjects his prophet to a scorching east wind until he once again cries out for God to kill him. Jonah is asked then if he regretted the destruction of the vine. The prophet loudly assures God that he did, indeed, and the divine trap is sprung. God's final recorded words to Jonah must have softened his stubborn and carnal heart. In chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle Jonah chapter 4 verse 10 and 11 the book of Amos the book of Amos 765 to 750 BC the name of Amos means burden as Middle Eastern names are usually meaningful the name may have referred to his unwelcome birth or been given as a prophecy of his future ministry to describe this burdened heart over Judah and Israel's sin. He was from the little town of Tekoa, some five miles from Bethlehem in Judea. Amos was a herdsman. Chapter 1, verse 1, and 7, verse 14 and 15. And a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Amos 7, 14. He had not graduated from the school of the prophets, but he was called by God to become a layman evangelist. He was called to be a prophet to the whole house of Jacob. Amos 3, verse 1 and verse 13, but chiefly to the northern kingdom. Verse Chapter 7, verse 14 and 15. At the main sanctuary, Bethel. At Bethel. 7, verse 10. Here he conducted his greater Samaritan revival campaign and thundered away on the subject of sin, separation, sanctification. Amos ministered during the reigns of Uzziah, king of Judah, and Jeroboam II, king of Israel, beginning his ministry some two years before a mighty earthquake had struck Palestine. Chapter 1, verse 1. This earthquake was so severe that Zedekiah, a later Hebrew prophet, referred to it some 250 years later. See Zechariah 14, verse 5. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us the earthquake, earthquake happened at the time when God punished King Uzziah with leprosy for his intrusion into the office of the priesthood. 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16 through 21. At the time of Amos's ministry, Israel, under powerful King Jeroboam II, was at its zenith of success. See Second Kings 14, verse 25. But along with the national pros nation's prosperity and come religious perversion, eight nations denounced, chapter 1 through 6. Syria, capital city, Damascus, chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. This nation had often harassed Israel, especially under Ben-Hadad I and King uh, Haziel. See Second Kings 10, verse 32 and 33. 1 Kings 20, verse 1 and 2, and 2 Kings 6, verse 24. God would thus burn down the palace of the capital city, break down their strongholds, cause many Syrians to die, and others to be carried back into Kerr, into the land of their former slavery. Compare 1, 5 with 9, 7. Kerr was located in Mesopotamia. See also 2 Kings 16, verse 9. Philistia, the capital city, Gaza. Chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. Philistia's four chief cities, Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Ekron, were to be judged because they sold Israelites into slavery to Edom. 2 Chronicles 21, verse 16 and 17, and Joel, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 4 through 8. 
Phoenicia, the capital city, Tyra. Watch chapter 1, verse 9 and verse 10. They had broken their covenant of brotherhood with Israel, referring to the agreement David and Solomon had made with Tyre. See 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 13. Israel had been attacked by Tyre, and its citizens led into slavery to Edom. Joel 3, verse 4 through 8. God would thus burn down the forts and palaces of Tyre. Edom, capital cities, Teman and Basra, Chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Teman was located southeast of Petra, and Basra was in the north central Edom. Even though the Edomites and the Israelites were closely related, one people from Esau and the other from Jacob, see Genesis 25, verse 30, Israel had suffered grievously at the hands of Edom. Malachi 1, verse 2, and Obadiah 1, verse 1 through chapter 1, verse 1 through 21. Their strongholds would thus be burned. Ammon, and the capital city was Rabbah, chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. The Ammonites, descendants of Lot's youngest daughter, Genesis 19, verse 38, had committed cruel crimes, ripping open pregnant Israelite women with their great swords during their expansion wars in Gilead. God would thus destroy their cities and enslave their people. Moab, the capital city, was Kerioth, chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, of Amos. These people were from Lot's older daughter, Genesis 19, verse 37, had, among other crimes, desecrated the tombs of the kings of the Edom <clears throat> with no respect for the dead. 2 Kings 3, verse 26 and verse 27. Moab would be defeated in battle and its palaces burned. Judah, the capital city, Jerusalem, chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 5. Judah had rejected the word of God and disobeyed the God of the word. They had hardened their hearts as the fathers had done. Israel, the capital city, was Samaria. Chapter 2, verse 6 through 16 of Amos. They had perverted judge justice by accepting bribes. They had sold the poor into slavery, trading them for a pair of shoes. Both Israel, both fathers and sons, were guilty of immorality with the same harlot. They were lounging in stolen clothing from their debtors at religious feasts. They had offered sacrifices of wine in the temple, which had been purchased with stolen money. They were absolutely unthankful for God's past blessing. They caused Nazareth to sin by tempting them to drink wine. Because of all this, God would make them groan as a loaded down wagon would groan, cause their swiftest warriors to stumble in battle. The whole house of Jacob, both Israel and Judah, chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 6, verse 14. Jake, Jacob's punishment equals her past privilege, chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? God was issuing one, them one final warning through his prophet. Chapter 3, verse 7. Jacob's enemies are called upon to attest to her wickedness. Chapter 3, verse 9. Her women had become cruel and demanding. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Her formal and empty religious ceremonies had become an insult to divine holiness. Chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Chapter 5, verse 21 through 26. They had surrounded themselves with gross luxury, with ivory beds to lie upon and the choicest food to eat. Chapter 6, verse 4. They had thought more of worldly music than their own Messiah. Chapter 6, verse 5. They had drunk wine by the bucket fool, perfumed themselves with sweet ointments, and totally neglected the poor and needy. Chapter 6, verse 6. God had tried everything to bring his people to their senses. Chapter 4, verse 6 through 13. But they had refused. Thus their former Savior would now become their judge. Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto you, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Chapter 4, verse 12. One final invitation is extended by God. Chapter 4, 5, verse 4 through 15. Seek him who maketh the stars and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. The invitation was rejected, and judgment would fall. Jacob would be consumed as a lion devours a sheep. 3 verse 12. There would be crying in the streets and every road. 5 verse 16. And that day they would be like a man who escaped from a lion only to meet a bear. 
They would be as one who leans against a wall in a dark room and puts his hand up on a snake. 5 verse 19. 90% 90 of their soldiers would fall in battle. 5 verse 3. Five visions announced. Chapter 7 through 9. The locust plague. Chapter 7 verse 1 through 3. In a vision God revealed to Amos his intentions to destroy all the main crops that sprung up after the first mowing. Amos interceded for Israel and a merciful God changed his course of action. The vision of the great fire. 7 verse 4 through 6. Amos saw a destructive fire, the heat from which was so fierce that it consumed the very waters of Palestine. This was to fall upon the land to punish sin. Again the prophet pled for mercy, and again God set aside this deserved judgment. The vision of the plumb line, 7-16. Seven, seven Amos viewed the Lord as he stood beside a wall built with a plumb line to see if it was straight. God informed Amos that he would continue testing Israel with the plumb line of heavenly justice, that he would no longer turn away from punishing, that he would destroy the dynasty of Jeroboam II by the sword. This, of course, literally happened as do all of God's prophecies. Jeroboam II was succeeded by his son Zechariah, who was assassinated by a rebel named Shalem after a reign of only six months. 2 Kings 15, verse 10 through 12. God would later use this same plumb line on Judah during the days of the wicked king Manasseh. 2 Kings 21, verse 13 through 15. At this point in his preaching ministry, Amos was confronted by Amaziah, the chairman of the Bethel Ministerial Association, who quickly issued two messages. One was to King Jeroboam II, warning him against the Bible-banging activities of Amos. The other was to Amos himself, ordering him to leave Bethel and to go back to his own land of Judah. Amos quickly responded that in spite of his lowly background, he was not a prophet or a prophet's son. He had been called by God and would not allow any middle-of-the-road spokesman to stop him. Amos then related to Amaziah the, from the Lord one of the most terrifying prophecies ever pronounced upon a human being. Because of the false priest's attempts to silence God's true prophet, Amaziah's wife would become a common Bethel Street prostitute. His sons and daughters would be killed. His land and possessions would be divided up. He himself would die as a captive in a heathen land. The vision of the basket of summer fruit, chapter 8, verse 1 through 14. The meaning of this vision, God showed Amos a basket filled with ripe fruit, explaining that it symbolized Israel, which was now ripe for judgment. The reason for this judgment vision, the cruel and Totally materialistic merchants of the northern kingdom had robbed the poor by selling them moldy food and trampled upon the needy. Longed for the Sabbath to end and various religious holidays to be over that they could once again start cheating using their weighted scales and undersized measures. Made slaves of the poor, buying them for their debt of a piece of silver and a pair of shoes. The result of this judgment vision, the riotous sound of singing in the temple would be turned to weeping. Dead bodies would fill the sh would be scattered everywhere. Fearful heavenly signs would occur. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the, di in the clear day. 8 verse 9. This frightened punishment will have its ultimate fulfillment during the coming great tribulation. Matthew 24, verse 22, and verse 29. There would be no comforting words from God. Chapter 8, verse 11, and verse 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. The vision of the Lord at the altar. Chapter 9, verse 1 through 15. The condemnation of Israel's transgressors. Chapter 9, verse 1 through 10. Though they dig into hell, there shall my hand take them. And though they climb up to heaven, from thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Mount Carmel, I will search and take them out from there. And though they be hidden from my sight in the bottom of the sea, there will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. Chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. The restoration of David's tabernacle. Chapter 9, verse 11 through 15. The Davidic monarchy was in 
a degraded condition with 10 out of the 12 tribes refusing to give homage to it. But during the glorious millennium, all this would change. Jesus quotes Amos 9, verse 11 and 12 at the Jerusalem Council, or James does rather, Acts 15, verse 14 through 17, and bases an important decision upon it, namely, should the Gentile be circumcised? However, was the sounding no. The blessings of this restored monarchy under Christ, the rightful seed of David, would be manifold. The harvest time will scarcely end before the farmer starts again to sow another crop. The terraces of grapes upon the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine. Israel's faithful will have for their fortunes restored and be permanently gathered in the glorious land. Hosea 755 to 715 B.C. The Introduction Hosea means salvation. He was a prophet to the northern kingdom and wept over their sins as Jeremiah later would reap, weep over Judah's sins. Hosea is perhaps the strangest book in all the Bible for God instructed this prophet to take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. There are several reasons why God did this. This experimental reason. By marrying an unfaithful wife, Hosea could, as perhaps no other single prophet, understand somewhat the anguish in God's own heart over the northern kingdom whose people were constantly committing spiritual fornication and adultery against Jehovah. God had often compared his relationship to Israel as that of a marriage. Isaiah 62 verse 5, Hosea 2 verse 19, Jeremiah 3 verse 14. The illustrative reason, his own marriage would become a walking, invisible example of his message to Israel. The prophetical reason, God would command him to name his children by those titles which would describe the future punishment and eventually restoration of all Israel. He may have ministered longer than any other prophet. Hosea predicted the Assyrian invasion and later lived to see these prophecies fulfilled in 721 B.C. In his book, he referred to the northern kingdom as Ephraim constantly. Ephraim was the first of the twelve tribes of the Israel to backslide. Hosea is quoted more times for its size in the New Testament than any other Old Testament book for a total sum of 30 times. Hosea 11 verse 1 with Matthew 2 verse 15. Hosea 6 verse 6 with Matthew 9 verse 13. Hosea 10 verse 8 with Luke 23 verse 30. Hosea 2 verse 23 with Romans 9 verse 25. Hosea 13 verse 14 with Romans 10 verse Romans Hosea 13 verse 14 with 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55 and Hosea 10 verse 8 with Luke 23 verse 30. Grieving husband and his grievous wife Hosea versus Gomer chapter 1 through 3. A. Hosea's wife ill famed. His wife Gomer was apparently a harlot before major marriage and an adulteress after marriage. Hosea attempts in vain to save this marriage by bearing her from the markets of the world by borrowing her from the markets of the world. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her path. Chapter 2, verse 6. Hosea thought he could force her to remain home in this manner. He even sought to the help of his first son, Jezreel, asking him to reason with his mother concerning the folly, the folly of her ways. Plead with your mother, contend, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her harlotry out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts. Chapter 2, verse 2. But all this was no, to no avail. Gomer apparently continued to run off at the first opportunity, buying her out of the markets of the world. It was not long before Gomer had been used, abused, and abandoned by her lustful lovers and found herself in a slave market. God ordered Hosea to find and redeem her from the market. So I bought her for myself for 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and for a half omer of barley. Chapter 3, verse 2. Hosea's children, ill-famed. The prophet fathered three children through Gomer. Each child at God's command was given a name which carried with it prophetic meaning. The first child, a boy named Jezreel, chapter 1, verse 4, meaning to be scattered, predicted two future events. The setting aside of the dynasty of the northern king named Jehu. This brutal and bloody king has slain many in, in and around the city of Jezreel. Among his victims were the northern king Jehoram, 
And the Judean king Ahaziah on the same day, 2 Kings 9, verse 14 through 28. Jezebel, 2 Kings 9, verse 33. Ahab 70 sons, 2 Kings 10, verse 1 through 10. Ahab's distant relatives and political friends, 2 Kings 10, verse 11 and verse 17. The royal princes of Judah, 2 Kings 10, verse 12 through 14. The priests of Baal, 2 Kings 10, verse 10 through 28, verse 18 through 28. While God did indeed order him to avenge Naboth, whose innocent blood Ahab had shed, 1 Kings 1 20, chapter 21, the brutal Jehu went too far in his bloodletting. Because of this, Jehu would be allowed only four generations upon Israel's throne, 2 Kings 10, verse 30. These were his first generation, Jehoahaz, his son, second generation, Jehoash, his grandson, third generation, Jeroboam II, his great-grandson, and the fourth generation, Zechariah, his great-great-grandson. At the time of the birth of Hosea's son, Jehu's third generation was ruling in the person of Jeroboam II. Thus, it would not be long until the dynasty would end. This, of course, happened in the days of Zechariah, who was murdered after a reign of but six months, Second Kings 15, verse 12. The Assyrian invasion, at which time the entire northern kingdom would be scattered, chapter 1, verse 5. The second child, a girl named Lohurema, chapter 1, verse 6, this name literally meant no more mercy, indicating that God's judgment was just around the corner. Along with this baby, however, came the promise that God would spare Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, of his coming Assyrian invasion. See first Kings, I mean, see chapter 1, verse 7. <laughs> of Hosea. This of course happened as recorded in 2 Kings 19 verse 35. The third child, a boy named Loami, chapter 1 verse 9, here the name means not my people. A grieving husband and his grievous wife, God versus Ephraim, 4, chapter 4 verse 14 of Hosea. Ephraim denounced because of her ignorance. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Chapter 4, verse 6, Hosea. Because of her idolatry, my people ask counsel of their idols. They sacrifice upon the top of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Chapter 4, verse 12, 13, and verse 17. Because of immorality. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredoms, and Israel is defiled. Chapter 5, verse 3. Ephraim's desire, in spite of her wickedness, God still loved her. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew it goeth away. Chapter 6, verse 4. Ephraim described, she was aflame with lust like a baker's hot oven. Chapter 7, verse 4. God said the hearts of the people smoldered with evil plots during the night and burned into flaming fire the next morning. They mingled with the children, I mean with the heathen, and had become as useless as a half-baked cake. Chapter 7, verse 8. They were as, as a silly dove calling to Egypt and flying to Assyria for help. Chapter 7, verse 11. They were as a crooked bow, always missing the target, which was God's glory. Chapter 7, verse 16. They lay among the nations as a broken pot. Chapter 8, verse 8. They were as a wandering and lonely wild ass. Chapter 8, verse 9. They were as a dried up root. Chapter 9, verse 16. They were as an empty vine. Chapter 10, verse 1. They were as a backsliding heifer, chapter 4, verse 16. Ephraim is disciplined, God declared, for they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. 8, verse 7, see also 10, verse 13. God would therefore for a while withhold his mercy from them, chapter 2, verse 4. They would be many days without a king, and seven. this is in 3, verse 4. A, without a king, in 721 B.C., Hosea, Israel's last king, was dethroned. And in 587 B.C., Zedekiah, Judah's final king, was disposed. Some six centuries later, Israel's only true king was rejected. John 19, verse 15. Thus, this tragic situation will continue until Jesus comes back again in Revelation 19, verse 11 through 21. A prince. The next recorded prince in Israel's future will not minister until the millennium. See Ezekiel 44 verse 3. The sacrifice. 
In A.D. 70, Titus destroyed the temple and all the animal sacrifices ceased. During the tribulation, they will once again be instituted only to be stopped by the Antichrist. Daniel 9, verse 27. An image, this literally means the pillars and may refer to the temple. A temple will be rebuilt during the tribulation. Revelation chapter 13 and destroyed. Zechariah 14, verse 2 and again raised during the millennium. Ezekiel 40, verse 48. An ephod, a reference to Israel's high priesthood. The ephod was a garment he wore. Her last high priest personally planned the murder of the nation's own Messiah. John 11, verse 49 through 51, and Matthew 26, verse 57 through 68. Teraphim. These were normally figures or images in human form. See Genesis 31, verse 34. It is not known what Hosea had in mind here. They would go off as slaves into Assyria. Chapter 10, verse 6. They would be for a while swallowed up among the nations. Chapter 8, verse 8. Chapter 9, verse 17. Ephraim delivered. Someday this glorious event will take place. Note the following passages. In Hosea, chapter 2, verse 19. And verse 23, chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, chapter 11, verse 1, verse 4, verse 8, verse 9, chapter 13, verse 10, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 4 through 7. Machia, 740 to 690 B.C. Introduction. Micah lived on the Philistine border at a town called Moresheth, about 25 miles southeast of Jerusalem. He was contemporary with Isaiah. Micah was a country preacher while Isaiah was a court preacher. Micah was God's final prophet to the northern kingdom. He was the only prophet sent to both the southern and northern kingdoms. He ministered especially to the capitals of these kingdoms, Jerusalem and Samaria. He includes an amazing number of prophecies in his short book. The fall of Samaria, chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. The invasion of Judah by the Assyrians, chapter 1, verse 9 through 16. The eventual fall of Jerusalem and destruction of his temple in chapter 3, verse 12, and chapter 7, verse 13. The exile in Babylon, chapter 4, verse 10. The return from captivity and future restoration of Israel, chapter 4, verse 1 through 8, and 13. And chapter 7, verse 11, and, and verse 14. The birth of Christ in Bethlehem, chapter 5, verse 2. The future reign of Christ, chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, and chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 7. Micah is quoted on three occasions by the elders of Judah, Jeremiah 26, verse 18, quoted by Micah in 3, quoting Micah 3, 12, by the Magi coming to Jerusalem in Matthew 2, verse 5 and 6, quoting from Matthew from Micah 5, verse 2, by Jesus when sending out the twelve, Matthew 10, 35 and 36, quoted by Micah 7, verse 6. The outward look. Micah's public sermons, chapter 1 through chapter 6, proclaiming the retribution upon Israel, chapter 1, verse 3. The first sermon, 1, God himself will soon respond in judgment because of the sins found in Samaria and Jerusalem, chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. Samaria would be utterly destroyed, chapter 1, verse 6. This, of course, happened during the Assyrian invasion, 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 1 through 18. The enemy will come up to the very gates of Jerusalem, chapter 1, verse 9. But God would spare his beloved city for yet another 115 years before allowing the Babylonians to destroy it, 2 Kings 19, verse 35. The second sermon, God condemns those who lie awake at night plotting a wickedness and rise at dawn to perform it, chapter 2, verse 1. He promises to reward their evil with evil, chapter 2, verse 3. Israel rejects her true prophets, telling them that God would never do such things, chapter 2, verse 6. Their punishment will only end when the Messiah, the breaker and king of it, and king of 2.13 leads them out of exile through the gates of their city of captivity back to their own land. His third sermon, Israel's leaders are especially rebuked by God. They were supposed to know what right from wrong, but were themselves the vilest of all sinners. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Their corrupt and crowd-pleasing messages would lead to the destruction of the people. Chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. 
Micah alone, other prophets at that time, was full of power of the, by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Chapter 3, verse 8. Because of those false prophets, Jerusalem would later be plowed as a field and become a heap of rubble. The very spot on Mount Moriah where the temple stood would be overgrown with brush. Chapter 3, verse 12. Prophesying the restoration of Israel. Chapter 4 and 5. In spite of her terrible sins, God would someday after her punishment had been consummated, restore her to Palestine. The chronology leading to this restoration, Judah must first suffer the 70-year Babylonian captivity, chapter 4, verse 10. This was a remarkable passage indeed, for at the time Michael wrote, Babylon was anything but a world power. Assyria was a strong nation then. Judah's message would be born in Bethlehem, or Judah's Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, chapter 5, verse 2, that God would set them aside a while as a nation until their spiritual rebirth during the tribulation, in 5, verse 3. The nations would gather together against Israel at Armageddon, 4, verse 11. See also Revelation 16, verse 13 through 16, and 19, verse 11 through 21. These nations would be utterly destroyed, 5, verse 5. The final result of this restoration, Michael 4, verse 1 through 6, pleading for the repentance of Israel. See Micah 6, verse 3 through 8. The inward look, Micah's personal contemplations, chapter 7, verse 1 through 6. Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits as the grape gleanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit, chapter 7, verse 1. The outward look, Micah's prayerful petitions, chapter 7, verse 7 through 20. His decision for God. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me, chapter 7, verse 7. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to light and I shall behold his righteousness. Chapter 7, verse 9. His description of God. Chapter 7, verse 18 through 20. Who is like who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham which thou hast sworn unto thy, our fathers from the days of old. Isaiah Introduction. The book of Isaiah may be compared to the Bible. The Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Old Testament has 39 books. The first section of Isaiah has 39 books. The New Testament has 27 books. The last section of Isaiah has 27 chapters. Then the Old Testament covers the history and sin of Israel, as does Isaiah 1, verse 39. The New Testament describes the person and ministry of Christ, as does Isaiah 40 through 66. The New Testament begins with the ministry of John the Baptist. The second section of Isaiah, chapter 40, begins by predicting this ministry. The New Testament ends by referring to the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah ends his book by describing the same things. Isaiah 66, verse 22, with Revelation 21, verse 1 through 3. The book of Isaiah is generally regarded as one of the six greatest books in the Bible. The others are Romans, John, Psalms, Genesis, and Revelation. A copy of this book was among the famous Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in 1947 in a cave, one at Kurum, K-U-M-R-A-N. It was copied in the 2nd century B.C. and consisted of 17 sheets, which were 24 feet in length by 10 inches high. This copy was amazingly similar to the standard Masoretic text of the 12th century A.D. Isaiah was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets and one of the most eloquent writers who ever lived, at times even surpassing the literary literary abilities of a Shakespeare, a Milton, or a Homer. He prophesied during the reigns of five kings of Judah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Manasseh. He is called a Messianic prophet. 
Only the Psalms have more material about Christ than Isaiah. Jesus said, Isaiah saw the glory of Christ and spoke of him. In John chapter 12, verse 41. Isaiah was married and had two sons. It is believed that his father Amos was the brother of King Amaziah of Judah. This would then make Isaiah of the royal seed. Isaiah wrote other books which have not been preserved, such as The Life of Uzziah, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 22, A Book of the Kings of Israel and Judah, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 32. Isaiah is quoted more times in the New Testament than any other Old Testament prophet. These passages quoted his words in reference to the ministry of John the Baptist, Matthew 3, verse 3, Luke 3, verse 4, and John 1, verse 23, ministry of Christ to the Gentiles, Matthew 4, verse 14 and 15, chapter 12, verse 17 and 18, the future rule of Christ over the Gentiles, Romans 15, verse 12, the healing ministry of Christ, in Matthew 8, verse 17, the blindness of Israel, Matthew 13, verse 14, and Acts 28, verse 25 through 27. The hypocrisy of Israel, Matthew 15, verse 7. The disobedience of Israel, Romans 10, verse 16, and verse 20. The saved remnant of Israel, Romans 9, 27, and 29. The sufferings of Christ, Acts 8, 28, and verse 30. The anointing of Christ, in Luke 4, 17. The book of Isaiah, general outline, summary of Isaiah's prophecies, various personalities mentioned in Isaiah, the greatness of God, the Messiah, the sins of Israel, the Gentile nations, the tribulation, and the millennium. The general outline, Israel, God's faithless servant and her various enemies, chapter 1 through chapter 35. Her sins listed, chapter 1, chapter 3. In chapter 5, her predicted, her future predicted, chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 9, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 25 through 35. Her great prophet's vision, chapter 6. Her wicked king's unbelief, chapter 7. Her enemy's judge, chapter 13 through chapter 23. Babylon, chapter 13, 14, and 21. Assyria, chapter 14, verse 24 through 27. Philistia, chapter 14, verse 28 through 32, Moab, chapter 15 and 16, Damascus, chapter 17, Ethiopia, chapter 18, Egypt, chapter 19 and chapter 20, Edom, or Idumea, chapter 34, verse 5 through 15, Arabia, chapter 21, verse 13 through 17, and Tyre, chapter 23, and the entire world, chapter 24 and chapter 25. Hezekiah, God's frightened servant, chapter 36 through chapter 39. Hezekiah and the king of Assyria, chapter 36 through 37. Hezekiah and the king of heaven, chapter 38. Hezekiah and the king of Babylon, chapter 39. Christ, God's faithful servant, chapter 40 through chapter 66. The deliverance, the comfort of Jehovah, chapter 40 through chapter 48. God and the idols, chapter 40 through 46. God and the nations, chapter 47 and 48. The deliverer, the salvation of Jehovah, chapter 49 through 57. The delivered, the glory of Jehovah, chapter 58 through chapter 66. A summary of Isaiah's prophecies. Prophecies fulfilled during his own lifetime. Judah would be saved from the threatened Syrian and Israelite invasion. Chapter 7, verse 4 and verse 16. Syria and Israel later to be destroyed by Assyria. Chapter 8, verse 4. Chapter 17, verse 1 through 14. Chapter 28, verse 1 through 4. That Assyria would invade Judah. Chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. Jerusalem would be saved during this invasion, chapter 37, verse 35 through 33 through 35. Moab would be judged by the Assyrians within three years, chapter 15 and 16. Ethiopia and Egypt would be conquered by the Assyrians, chapter 18 through chapter 20. <clears throat> Arabia would be destroyed, chapter 21, 13 through 17. Tyre to be destroyed, chapter 23, verse 1 through 3. Hezekiah's life would be extended by 15 years, chapter 38, verse 5. Assyria would be judged by God, chapter 10, verse 5 through 34, chapter 14, verse 24 through 27, chapter 30, verse 27 through 30, and chapter 37, verse 36.
The prophecy is fulfilled after his lifetime. The Babylonian captivity, chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. Chapter 5, verse 26 through 30. Chapter 22, verse 1 through 14. Chapter 39, verse 5 through 7. Babylon to be overthrown by Cyrus. Chapter 13, verse 17 through 22. Chapter 14, verse 1 through 23. Chapter 21, verse 2. Chapter 46, verse 11. Chapter 48, verse 14. Babylon to suffer perpetual desolation. Chapter 13, verse 10 through 22. And 14, 1 through 15. That's chapter 47, verse 1 through 15. The conquest of a Persian named Cyrus. Chapter 41, verse 2 and 3. Chapter 44, verse 28. Chapter 45, verse 1 through 4. They return to Jerusalem's decree by Cyrus. Chapter 44, verse 38. Chapter 45, verse 13. The joy of the returning remnant. Chapter 48, verse 20. And also Psalms, chapter 126. The restoration of Tyre. Chapter 23, verse 13 through 18. The perpetual desolation of Edom. Chapter 34, verse 5 through 17. The birth, earthly life, sufferings, death, resurrection, ascension, and exaltation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 7, verse 14 and 15. Chapter 9, verse 1, 2, and verse 6. Chapter 11, verse 1, verse 2. Chapter 35, verse 5 and 6. Chapter 42, verse 1 through 3. Chapter 50, verse 4 through 6. Chapter 52, verse 13 through 15. Chapter 53, verse 2. And then verse 10 through 12. In verse 15, and chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. The ministry of John the Baptist, chapter 40, verse 3 through 5. The prophecy is yet to be fulfilled, the tribulation. Chapter 2, verse 10 through 22. Chapter 13, verse 6 through 13. Chapter 24, verse 1 through 23. Chapter 26, verse 1, verse 21 and 20. Chapter 34, verse 1 through 10. And chapter 51, verse 6. The battle of Armageddon. Isaiah chapter 34 verse 1 through 10, chapter 43 verse 13 and 14, chapter 63 verse 1 through 6, chapter 66 verse 15 and 16. The Millennium, Isaiah 2 verse 2 through 4, chapter 4 verse 2 through 6, chapter 11 verse 6 through 10, and verse 12, chapter 35 verse 1 through 10, chapter 40 verse 4 and verse 5. Chapter 43, verse 13 and 14 and 16. Chapter 44, verse 23. Chapter 49, verse 10 through 13. Chapter 51, verse 3 and verse 11. Chapter 51, verse 1. 52, verse 1. And in verse 6 through 10. Chapter 56, verse 6 to 8. Chapter 59, verse 20 and verse 21. Chapter 60, verse 1 through 3. And verse 11 through 13. And then verse 19 through 22. Chapter 62, verse 1 through 4. Chapter 63, verse 1 through 6. Chapter 65, verse 18 through 25. Chapter 66, verse 10, 12, 15, 16, and 23. The various personalities. Isaiah, the greatest Old Testament prophet and author of this book, chapter 1, verse 1. He viewed the glory of God as few men have ever experienced, chapter 6, verse 1 through 13. For other experiences, we see the accounts of Moses, Exodus 33, verse 18 through 23. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1 through 28 and chapter 10. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 through 14. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 through 9. Stephen, Acts chapter 7, verse 55 through 60. Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. John, Revelation chapter 4, verse chap through chapter 22. He was ordered to offer wicked King Ahaz as a sign, a sign concerning God's faithfulness, chapter 7, verse 3. He fathered two children, Sh uh, Shir Jashub, chapter 7, verse 3, and Meher Shalahashbaz, chapter 8, verse 3. Given them names which depicted coming events in prophecy. He was ordered to walk barefooted and naked, perhaps from the waist up, for three years to symbolize the troubles God would bring upon the Egyptians and the Ethiopians, chapter 20, verse 1 through 6. Ahaz, the wicked father of Hezekiah, who refused God's gracious sign of his faithfulness to Judah in their hour of need, chapter 7, verse 1 through 25. 
Lucifer, that powerful and perverted angel who rebelled against God, became known as Satan and the devil. Chapter 12, 14, verse 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Chapter 12, 14, verse 12 through 14 of Isaiah. We know these foolish, five foolish and fatal eye wills of the devil. I will ascend into heaven. Obviously, Satan had the third heaven in mind here, the very abode of God. See 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1 through 4. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. This is probably a reference to angels. Satan desired the worship of angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Lucifer now sought to enter God's executive office somewhere in the north and sit at God's very desk. He would attempt to control not only the angels, but the size and the number of the starry galaxies. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. This may well refer to that special Shekinah glory cloud of God found so frequently in the Bible. I will be like the Most High. It is revealing to note that the name for God that Satan used here, he wanted to be like El Elyon, the Most High. This name really means the strongest strong one. The devil could have picked the other names for God, he could have used El Shaddai, which means the breasted one, the one who feeds his children. But he didn't. He might have selected Jehovah Rohi, which means the shepherd God, but he avoided this title also. The reason is obvious. Satan coveted God's strength, but was not the least bit interested in his feeding and his leading attributes. Shebna, chapter 22, verse 15 through 25. He was the indulgent and utterly self-centered palace administrator, perhaps during Hezekiah's early reign, who was rebuked and set aside by God. Eliakim, chapter 36, verse 3. He replaced the selfish Shibna and was Hezekiah's spokesman during the Assyrian crisis led by Sennacherib. Rabshakeh, chapter 36, verse 2. The personal and arrogant, loud-mouthed Syrian spokesman during the siege of Sennacherib. In Sennacherib, chapter 37, verse 21. The Assyrian commander-in-chief, whose efforts to destroy Jerusalem were totally blocked by God's death angel. Hezekiah, chapter 36, verse 1. The thirteenth king of Judah, who was on the throne when God saved Jerusalem and also extended the king's life by fifteen years. Mer Merodach Baladin, chapter 39, verse 1. The king of Babylon, who sent spies disguised as goodwill ambassadors to congratulate Hezekiah after his recovery. Their real mission was to discover the amount and location of Jerusalem's wealth. John the Baptist, chapter 40, verse 3 through 5. Compare these verses with Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, Mark chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 3, Luke chapter 3, verse 2 through 6, and John chapter 1, verse 23. Cyrus chapter 44, verse 28, chapter 45, verse 1. The Persian monarch, whose name and ministry to the Jewish remnant is in allowing them to return and rebuild the temple, Isaiah prophesied some two centuries before he was even born. The greatness of God. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Scarlet, a reference to a deep dyed character of sin. See Numbers 19 verse 2 verse 6 verse 9. Snow, Psalm 51 verse 7. Reason together. God appeals to man's intellect as well as to his emotions. We are not to simply put our brains into neutral in our dealing with God. See Isaiah 43 verse 26, Romans 12 verse 2, Matthew 22 verse 37, and 2 Peter 3 verse 1. Isaiah chapter 12 verse 2 through 5. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. These blessed waters had formerly been rejected. See chapter 8 verse 6. And see John chapter 4, verse 10 and, and verse, verse 14.
Isaiah 25, verse 1, 4, 8, and 9. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. When the blast of the terrible ones is a storm against the wall, he will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Swallow up death. See 1 Corinthians 15 verse 54. Hosea 13 verse 14 and Revelation chapter 20 verse 14. Wipe away tears. See Revelation 7 verse 17 and 21 verse 4. Isaiah 40 chapter 40 verse 1 through 31. Concerning verses 1 and 2, God orders the prophet to speak tenderly to and comfort the hearts of his people. The message of comfort is threefold. Their term of forced service is complete. Their guilt is pardoned. They have received ample punishment for their sins. Concerning verses 3-5, through five, the voice had its partial fulfillment at his first coming through the mouth of John the Baptist, Matthew 3, verse 3, but will only see its ultimate consummation at the second coming. Isaiah 35, verse 2. Note the main features of this proclamation. A straight highway in the desert was to be made for the king. Every valley was to be filled in. Every mountain and hill should be leveled off. When all this was accomplished spiritually in the hearts of the Israelites, then the glory of the Lord should be revealed to all flesh. Concerning verses 6 to 8, a heavenly voice orders an earthly voice to cry out concerning the greatness of God and the insignificance of man, saying, The beauty and duration of a man is as a flower and grass, which will soon fade and wither away. James 1, verse 10, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24, and verse 25. The word of our God, by contrast, would stand forever. Concerning verses 9 through 11, the voice now orders Zion's messenger up on the high mountain where they are to boldly proclaim the following. Behold the king, the coming of your mighty God. He comes as a king to rule over you and to, your, to reward you. He comes as a shepherd to tenderly feed you and lead you. Concerning 12, verses 12 through 31. Of chapter 40. This coming king shepherd had, a, had all power as seen in his dealing with nature. Verses 12 through 14. He holds the ocean in his hands. He measures off the heavens. He knows the weight of the earth and mountains. He needs no advice from angels, demons, or men. See Romans 11 verse 34 and 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. As seen in his dealings with the nations, verse 15 through 17, all people are as a drop in the bucket and dust on the scales. He picks up the islands as if they had no weight at all. All of Lebanon's forests do not contain sufficient fuel to consume a sacrifice large enough to honor him, nor all its animals enough to offer God. As seen in his dealings with vain idols, verse 18 through 20, God cannot even be remotely depicted by a wooden or a golden idol. Man can create a false god, but only God can create man. See chapter 41, verse 6 and 7, and verse 21 through 24, and verse 29, and chapter 44, verse 9 through 20, chapter 46, verse 1, and verse 5 through 7. As seen in his dealing with the mighty of this earth, verses 21 through 24. Man's willful ignorance of God's greatness is inexcusable. Romans 1 verse 18 through 23 and 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 5. God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and views the inhabitants as grasshoppers. See Numbers 13 verse 33. He spreads out the heavens like a veil. He brings the great men of the world to naught. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26 through 29. They are scarcely planted until he removes them. Psalms 103, verse 15 and verse 16. As seen in his dealings with the stars, verse 25 and 26. He originally created all the stars. He knows their number. He has named each one. Psalm 147, verse 4. As seen in his dealings with the elect, verse 27 through 31. In light of all this, God's children are not to question his dealings with them. Isaiah 54, verse 7 and 8. The eternal God has unending strength and unfathomable insight. He therefore gives power to the faint 
to wait upon him. This allows them to walk, run, and fly as eagles. Chapter 41, verse 8 through 10. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Israel, my servant, Schofield notes the following. Three servants of the Lord mentioned in Isaiah, David, Isaiah 37, verse 35, Israel as a nation, Isaiah 41, verse 8 through 16, 43, verse 1 through 10, 44, verse 1 through 8, and verse 21, 45, verse 4, and 48, verse 20, and the Messiah, chapter 42, verse 1 through 12, 49, 5 through 7, 50, verse 4 through 6, 52, verse 13 through 15, and 53, verse 1 through 12. Isaiah 42, verse 8 to 12. The former things are come to pass, a possible reference to the fall of Babylon. Isaiah 13, verse 17 through 22, and 21, verse 1 through 10. And the destruction of Assyria. Isaiah 10, verse 5 through 34, 14, verse 24 through 27, 30, 27 through 33, and 31, chapter 31, verse 8. New things do I declare. The suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jehovah's servant, Jesus Christ. Chapter 52, verse 13 through 15, and chapter 53, verse 1 through 12. Let the inhabitant of the rock sing, a possible reference to the hiding remnant in Petra during the tribulation. See Zechariah 14, verse 5, Daniel 11, verse 41. Isaiah 43, verse 2, verse 5 and 6, and verse 11 and verse 25. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Now shall the flame kindle upon thee. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, Keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I, even I, am he that blotted out thy transgressions for my own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Through the waters, Exodus chapter 14, verse 19 through 31, through the fire, Psalm 66, verse 12, and Daniel chapter 3, verse 25 through 27. From the east, west, north, and south, see Matthew 24, verse 31. Beside me there is no Savior. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Who blotteth out thy transgressions? Isaiah 44, verse 22, and Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And will remember, not remember thy sins. Psalms 103, verse 10 through 12. Isaiah 38, verse 17. Isaiah 48, verse 22. Micah 7, verse 19. And Hebrews 8, verse 12. Isaiah 44, verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. See Joel 2, verse 28 through 32. And Acts chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Isaiah 45, verse 5 through 12, and verse 18 through 23. I girded thee, verse 5. This passage describes the work of Cyrus, who would allow the Jews in Babylon to return. God reminds all here that he followed Cyprus, Cyrus to cap, that he allowed Cyprus, Cyrus to capture Babylon. I create evil, verse 7. God is, of course, not the author of sin. See Habakkuk. 1 verse 13, 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, Titus 1 verse 2, James 1 verse 13, and 1 John 1 verse 5. One of the meanings of the Hebrew word is ra, carry the idea of adversity or calamity, which is obviously the intended meaning here. Woe to him that striveth with his maker, verse 9. See Isaiah 10 verse 15, 29 verse 16, and Romans 9 verse 19 through 21. Sinful Israel is here pictured as questioning God's dealing with her, accusing him of being all thumbs. Note the expression, he hath no hands. This, of course, was sheer insanity, for God points out later that those same hands had made the earth and created man. See verse 12. I have not spoken in secret. 
God never dealt in esoteric knowledge which was available only for a select few. See John 18 verse 19 and 20. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. Verse 22. This was the verse that led the great Charles H. Spurgeon to Christ according to his testimony. Every knee shall bow. Romans 14 verse 11. Philippians 2 verse 5 through 11. Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9 and verse 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times of things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Remember the things of old. Verse 9. Perhaps God had in mind those such as the Passover salvation, the Red Sea deliverance, the sweetened waters of Mara, and the heavenly manna. Declaring the end from the beginning in verse 10. Bible prophecy is simply history written in advance. Isaiah 49 verse 13 through 16. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Isaiah 55 verse 1 through 3. This title may be entitled The Incredible Invitation. The host of the invitation, verse 1. God himself. Here is the Father is depicted as standing behind a booth in an eastern marketplace seeking the attention of those who pass by. The guests of the invitation, verse 1, who are invited, all the thirsty and penniless. The meaning of the invitation, verse 1 and 2, these items constitute the original soul food of man, water and wine, a reference to the Spirit of God. John 7, verse 37 through 39, Ephesians 5, verse 18, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. Milk, a reference to the Word of God, 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Bread, a reference to the Son of God, John 6, verse 35. The terms of the invitation, chapter uh, 1, verse 6 and 7, chapter 55, verse 1. 6 and 7. Seek the Lord. Call upon him. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let him return unto the Lord. The time limit of the invitation. Verse 6 and 7. While he may be found, while he is near. The necessity of the invitation. Verse 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. An example of this invitation, verse 9 and 10, Rain, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. The promise of the invitation to Israel. A. The blessing of the Davidic covenant. Verse 4. The acceptance of all nations. Verse 5. The fullness of joy and peace. Verse 12. To nature. The removal of the curse. Verse 12 and 13. To all. The sublime soul satisfaction. Verse 2. Mercy and abundant pardon. Verse 7. Isaiah 57, verse 15, and then verse 19 through 21. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace be to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. A contrite and humble spirit, verse 15. See Psalms 34, verse 18, verse chapter 20. 51 verse 17, Isaiah 66 verse 2, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, and 1 Peter 5 verse 6. Peace be to him afar off, verse 19. Hebrews 13 verse 15, Acts 2 39, Ephesians 2 verse 17. There is no peace to the wicked, verse 21. See Isaiah 48 verse 22. 
Isaiah 61 verse 10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation he hath coveted, covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels the robe of righteousness Isaiah 64 verse 6 Genesis 3 verse 21 Matthew 22 verse 2 through 13 Revelation 19 verse 7 and 8 Jeremiah 33 verse 11 and Revelation 21 verse 2 Isaiah 63 verse 7 through 9 I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. He was afflicted. See Judges 10 verse 16. The angel of his presence. Genesis 16 verse 9, 22 verse 11. 48 verse 16, Exodus 3 verse 2, 14 verse 19, Numbers 22 verse 22, Judges 2 verse 4, 6 verse 11, 13 verse 3, 2 Kings 19 verse 35, Zechariah 1 verse 12, and 12 verse 8. The Messiah, His incarnation, Isaiah 7 verse 14 and 15. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he not eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. It should be noted that three children are mentioned in connection with Isaiah's visit to King Ahaz, and the wicked rulers refused to ask God for a sign. Two of these children were yet unborn. They are Emmanuel, meaning God with us, there are six major implications within chapter 7, verse 14. This sign was to be given by God. Note the phrase, the Lord himself. It was given to the entire house of David and not to Ahaz. The word you hear is plural. It involved a miraculous sign. God had, invited, had just invited Ahaz to ask of him any fantastic miracle he desired, whether in the depth or in the height above. See verse 11. It concerned a virgin birth. The Hebrew word Alma was a common term for an unmarried and sexually undefiled girl. Genesis 24, verse 43, Exodus 2, verse 8, Psalms 68, verse 25, Song of Solomon 1, verse 3, and Proverbs 30, verse 19. Were the promised babe not to have been virgin born, this could scarcely have been considered a mighty sign. See Matthew 1, verse 22, and verse 23. For the fulfillment of this, where the Greek word P-A-R-T-H-E-N-O-S is used, a term depicting absolute virginity. This mighty miracle sign would result in the very incarnation of God himself into human flesh, for the baby's name was to be Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This divine babe would also be completely human, eating what other children ate and growing to maturity like other children. Isaiah 7:16, Luke 2, verse 52. Sheer Jasher, meaning a remnant shall return. Chapter 7, verse 3. This tiny child was Isaiah's son who accompanied him to, Isaiah, to Ahaz's palace. Isaiah told the unbelieving king that before this young boy reached the age to know right from wrong, both of Ahaz's enemies, Pekah and Reason, would be destroyed. This was literally fulfilled by the Assyrian monarch Tiglath Pileser, who slew the Damascus king Reason in 732 BC, 2 Kings 16, verse 9, and by Hoshea, who murdered Pekah shortly after this in 2 Kings 15, verse 30. Meher Shalahashbaz, meaning hasten to the booty, hurry to the prey. Chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. This child. Also the son of Isaiah was called by this name to indicate the Assyrian captivity of the northern Israelite kingdom. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be up on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. 
Both his humanity and deity are seen here. The phrase, a child is born, refers to his humanity. Luke 2, verse 7, Hebrews 2, verse 14, 1 John 4, verse 9. The phrase, son is given, refers to his deity. John 3, 16. Five great names are ascribed to this child, son of Mary and God. Wonderful. This is a noun in the Hebrew and therefore is a real name. See Judges 13, verse 18, where it is translated secret. Counselor, the child's son would never need an advisory board for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor. Romans 11, verse 34. John 2, verse 24 and verse 25. The mighty God, here is L-G-I-B-B-O-H-R, God's strong hero. The everlasting father, literally, Avid, the father of eternity. See John 1 verse 3, Colossians 1 verse 16, Hebrews 1 verse 2. So you can see here that he in eternity was the everlasting father, the eternal God, the word of God, the creator to the ends of the earth. All things were made by, for, by him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things consist. But as the son, he was man. He was human. He was the God man. He was father in eternity and Son in redemption and the Holy Ghost in the church. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Spirit of Jesus Christ in you. The Prince of Peace. This is Sar Shalom and as described in Isaiah 57 verse 15 through 19. From the very dawn of history, the wicked world has desperately sought to employ the services of someone or something who could heal the hurt of the human soul and usher in the long dream of universal righteousness. Many persons have applied for this position and numerous methods have been employed, but all have led to the bitter disappointment and despair. But here the prophet Isaiah introduces a special candidate. What are his qualifications? Can he satisfy the five key questions? What about his personality and character? Answer is, it is wonderful. What about his education? Answer, he knows all things and is therefore the supreme creator the supreme counselor. What about his nationality? Answer, he is the mighty God. The everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. What about his previous work experience? Answer, he both planned for and carried out the creation of this universe and is therefore the Father of Eternity. What is his special talent? Answer, as the God-man, he is able to reconcile man to God and is therefore the Prince of Peace. In view of all this, Isaiah, along with Peter, Paul, John, and a host of others earnestly exhorts all sinners to hire this heavenly candidate immediately. See Isaiah 1 verse 18. His lowliness and youth in Nazareth. Isaiah 11 verse 1 and verse 2. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. This passage describes what is left of a once mighty tree after it had been cut down, a stump. That mighty tree, the kingdom of David and Solomon, would be cut to the ground by the Assyrians and the Babylonian X-Men. But this stump stands in obvious contrast to the vast number of dead stumps that covered the ground after God had hewn down the huge Assyrian forest described by Isaiah in chapter 10, as he will eventually do to all ungodly nations. But there is an important difference in that this stump is not dead. First, a rod or a sprig will spring from that supposed dead stump, and then that rod will branch out into fruit. See Revelation 5 verse 5. The Hebrew word for branch is N-E-T-S-E-R, and was probably what Matthew referred to when he stated that Christ came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Matthew 2, verse 23. The Holy Spirit of God was to rest upon the babe at Bethlehem and the citizen of Nazareth, thus giving to him the spirit of wisdom, that ability to discern the nature of things, the spirit of understanding, the ability to discern their differences, the spirit of counsel, the ability to adopt right conclusions, the spirit of power, the ability to carry them out, the spirit of knowledge, the ability to personally know the very essence of the Father himself. This characteristic can be considered the root of his humanity in the first of four for its first for its fruit the spirit of the fear of the Lord 
because of his knowledge, the ability to always refrain from displeasing him. See John verse 8, 29. 8, chapter 8, verse 29. Thus these seven, counting the Holy Spirit and his gifts, correspond to the seven lighted lampstand with its main shaft and the three pairs of branches from the sides. See Exodus 25, verse 31 and 32, Revelation 1, verse 4, Revelation 4, verse 5, and Revelation 5, verse 6. Isaiah 53, verse 2. For he shall grow up before him like a tender plant, and like a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This verse is only quoted here. It will be dealt with on the aspect of his suffering in connection with Isaiah 53. Isaiah 7, 15. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know how to refuse the evil and the good. This refers to the relative poverty of the Savior's family. Thick and milk and honey were the food of desert wanderers. They were, of course, not only the only articles of food, but provided the staples. His relationship to the Father. Beloved by the Father, behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth justice to the nations. Isaiah 42 verse 1. This was quoted in Matthew 12, verse 18, and demonstrated in Matthew 3, verse 17, and 17, verse 5. The obedience to the Father. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth me morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear like the learned. The Lord God hath opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned backward. Isaiah 50, verse 4 and verse 5. See John chapter 7, verse 16, chapter 8, verse 28, and verse 38, chapter 12, verse 49, chapter 14, verse 10, and verse 24. Philippians 2, 8, Hebrews 10, verse 5. His specific ministry to the Gentiles. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as was her in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more gloriously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. Isaiah 9, verse 1 and verse 2. Here Isaiah points out that the very region where Assyrian armies brought darkness and death would be the first to rejoice in the light brought by the preaching of Christ. Matthew refers to the fulfillment of this prophecy in Matthew 4, verse 12 through 16. His gracious ministry to all. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth justice in the earth. Isaiah 42, verse 2 and verse 3. Here we are told three things God's righteous servant would not do during his course of his ministry. He would not scream out in the streets. Unlike other worldly and noisy warriors, this gentle conqueror would not allow his voice to be shouted out in the streets. Our Lord would bear absolutely no similarity to wild-eyed, shrieking rebels. He would not break the bruised reed. This he demonstrated when he freely forgave and restored an immoral woman whose sin had twisted and torn her soul. John 8, verse 1 through 11. He would not quench the smoking flax. This he demonstrated by releasing an army of evil spirits which had all but snuffed out the light of sanity and hope for the maniac of Gadara. Mark 5, verse 1 through 20. The fulfillment of this prophecy is recorded in Matthew 12, verse 14 through 21 and amplified in 11, verse 28 through 30. His miracles. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall a lame man leap us in heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6. Although this passage will have its ultimate fulfillment in the millennium, it does nevertheless refer in part to the earthly ministry of Christ. The eyes of the blind were opened. See Matthew 9, verse 29, Mark 8. Verse 25, John 9, verse 7, Matthew 12, verse 22, and Matthew 20, verse 34. The ears of the deaf were unstopped. Matthew 11, verse 5, Mark 7, verse 34. The crooked limbs of the lame were straightened. Matthew 9, verse 2, 
Mark 12, verse 13, and John 5, verse 8. His message, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Isaiah 61, verse 1 and verse 2. Schofield has the following helpful notes at this point. Observe that the Lord Jesus suspended the reading of this passage in the synagogue at Nazareth, Luke 4, verse 16 through 21, with the words, Year of the Lord. The first event, therefore, opened the day of grace, the acceptable year of the Lord, but does not fulfill the day of vengeance that will be accomplished when Messiah returns. See Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10, and compare with Isaiah 34, verse 8, and 35, verse 4. His suffering and death. In three key passages, Isaiah describes in accurate and awesome detail the crucifixion of Christ some 700 years before it took place. Isaiah 50, verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. This was, of course, literally fulfilled. The smiters, Matthew 27, verse 26, and verse 30, and John 18, verse 22. The spitters, Matthew 26, verse 67, and 27, verse 30, and Mark 14, verse 65, and 15, verse 19. Isaiah 52, 14. As many were astounded at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Schofield notes, the literal rending presents a shocking picture. So marred from the form of man was his aspect that his appearance was not that of a son of man, not human. This was the effect of the brutality described in Matthew 26, verse 67 and 68, and 27, verse 27 through 30. If this passage be taken at face value, it means that Christ suffered more on the cross than any other human being ever suffered anywhere, anytime. Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 10a. Concerning verses 1 through 3, these opening statements may be the voices of the believing Israelite remnant of all ages as they discuss his death. The first verse is literally, who believed what we heard? Love. L-E-U-P-O-L-D writes, So to speak, here we seem to hear two disciples standing on the street corner in Jerusalem reviewing the things that happened on Good Friday. That's actually on Wednesday. In the light of the better insight that came after Pentecost, they expressed especially their amazement at the complete misunderstanding they were guilty of in regard to the remarkable future that appeared. Remarkable figure that appeared as the great sufferer in their midst. They still marvel as they reflect on the, this blindness. An exposition of this can be seen through the testimony of two Emmaus disciples as they comment on their former unbelief. Luke 24, verse 13 through 32. The question, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed, should be compared with Psalm 8, verse 3. In this passage, David says it took only the fingers of God to create us, but Isaiah states it took his arms to redeem us. Verse 2 and verse 3 tell the life story of the Savior from his cradle to the cross. He was despised, counted as nothing because of his lowly background. See verse 2 and also John 1 verse 46. He was rejected because of his message. Verse 3 and also Luke 4 verse 16 through 30. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief because of his earthly mission. Verse 3. See Luke 19 verse 10. His humble beginning seemed to so unimportant. Who really noticed him as a Dripping lad in Nazareth. He could be likened to an insignificant shoot, a bit of vegetation that is scarcely noticed. What about the personal appearance of Christ? There is no biblical description of our Lord, for there was no need of this. He came as a suffering servant of Jehovah, and the only qualification of a suffer of a servant is that he be able to do the job. This is why Mark's gospel account, which pictures Christ as the ox servant of God, had no de genealogy. We may conclude that our Lord was humble, healthy, wholesome, but not handsome. He probably did not exude charisma, nor display a flashy and striking lifestyle. The late night talk show's host never would have considered booking him for an interview. 
Concerning verses 4 through 6, the Schofield notes the following about verse 4. Because Matthew quotes this passage and applies it to physical disease, uh, Matthew 8 verse 17, it has been conjectured by some that disease as well as sin was included in the atoning death of Christ, which it was. The last part of the verse 4 informs us that the nation of Israel in general looked upon the cross as the righteous sentence imposed upon by God himself upon a blasphemer named Jesus Christ. Matthew 27 verse 38 through 44. <laughs> Thus Israel looked here looked upon Jesus as Job's wife and friends looked upon Job as a man suffering for his sins. See Job 2 verse 9, 4 verse 7, 8 verse 3. Verse 5 tells us that he was wounded, translated tormented by Lang's commentary, and bruised or crushed for our iniquities. These two words, wounded and bruised, are the strongest terms to describe a violent and agonizing death. Verse 6 is the all verse as it begins and ends with this word. All we like sheep have gone astray. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Thus Christ took our hell that we might partake of his heaven. The blessed Son of God became the Son of Man, that the sons of men might become sons of God. He died alone, that we wouldn't have to. Concerning verses 7 through 9, some might ask, uh, we can know that Isaiah is really referring to Christ in chapter 53 since the Savior is not mentioned by name. But his identity is clearly brought out in the two New Testament passages which link him directly to Isaiah 53. Testimony of John the Apostle in John 12 verse 37 38. Here Isaiah 53 1 is quoted. Testimony of Philip Acts 8 verse 32 and 33. Isaiah 53 7 and 8 is quoted. We are here. We are told that although he was oppressed, treated unsparingly, yet he opened not his mouth, not once during his seven unfair trials before Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, Pilate, Herod, Pilate again, and the Roman soldiers did our Lord attempt to justify himself or demand a mistrial. See verse 7. John the Baptist was doubtless thinking of the phrase as a lamb to the slaughter when he first introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God. John 1.29. Verse 8 might be remembered rendered by oppression and an unjust sentence he was taken away and as to his fate who gave it any thought verse 9 tells us the religious officials planned to dump him into a potter's field along with two thieves of course God stepped in and he was placed in a new tomb owned by a rich man Matthew 27 verse 57 Schofield notes the following concerning verse 9 in the Hebrew the word rendered death is an intensive plural it has been suggested that it speaks of the violence of Christ's death the very pain of which made it like a repeated death Concerning verse 10a, who really killed Christ? Many, of course, played a part in his death. This would include Judas, Caiaphas, Annas, the wicked Jewish religious leaders, Pilate, Herod, the Roman soldiers, the devil, and the sins of all sinners. But who actually masterminded the original plan? Here we are told it was God himself. See the following, Acts 2, 23, 1 Peter 1, verse 18 through 20, Revelation 13, verse 8. the end of tape 15.